Okay, why don't we go ahead and get started then with today's uh, presentation. Welcome everyone to the Racial Justice Initiative Distinguished Lecture. I am Professor and Associate Dean Adrian Pantoja, and I am chairing the uh, I'm chairing President Oliver's Racial Justice Initiative. Before I turn the event over to Professor Ermi Willoughby, who will be introducing our speaker, I'd like to acknowledge the role President Oliver played in developing the Racial Justice Initiative. RJI emerged following the death of George Floyd and the ongoing police violence directed at the Black community. It emerged out of a desire to see Pitzer College at the forefront of generating ideas and action around the fight for racial equity and racial justice. With funding from the Andrew Mellon Foundation over the past years, RJI has transformed the curriculum, has sponsored speakers, panels, and funded student projects. I'm proud of what we have accomplished, and I can confidently say that we are in a better place because of it and because of President Oliver's bold leadership. Thank you, President Oliver. At this point, let me turn it over to Professor Ermi Willoughby, uh, who will be introducing herself and will be introducing our distinguished speaker. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm uh, Ermi Engineer Willoughby. I'm a faculty in the history department. Um, and I teach environmental history. Uh, thank you all for coming. Um, and thank you to President Oliver and the RJI Planning Committee um, for hosting this event. And um, many thanks to our distinguished speaker, um, Professor Deirdre Cooper Owens. Um, it's really an honor to introduce her to you all. Um, Professor Cooper Owens is an award-winning historian and public speaker. She is currently the Charles and Linda Wilson Professor in the History of Medicine and Director of the Humanities in Medicine Program at the University of Nebraska at Lincoln. Um, in this position, uh, Dr. Cooper Owens is one of two Black women in the U.S. Um, who is running a medical humanities program. Um, she's also Director of the Program in African American History at the Library Company of Philadelphia. Um, and as a teacher and public speaker, Professor Cooper Owens is committed to teaching community-based history. She's a proud graduate of two historically Black colleges and universities, the All Women's Bennett College in Greensboro, North Carolina, and Clark Atlanta University. She earned her PhD in history at UCLA and has had a number of prestigious fellowships at the University of Virginia, the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, and as a Big Ten Academic Leadership Fellow. Um, she's also the author of many um, books and articles, including her award-winning study of the origins of gynecology called Medical Bondage, Race, Gender, and the Origins of American Gynecology. Um, in this book, she explores how in the 19th century, experimental surgeries on enslaved and laboring women enabled the rise of American gynecology as a medical specialty and shaped our understanding of race Merging women's history, medical history, and social history, this book makes Black and Irish women's lives, not just their bodies, part of an origin story of American medicine, um, one that has largely been told with an exclusive focus on white male historical actors. Um, through her experience and expertise in US history and African-American history, the history of medicine and women and gender studies, she's steadily working towards making history more accessible and inspiring for all. Her talk today is titled, Why History Matters, Understanding America's Health Inequities. So I will turn it over to our speaker. Thank you so much, Professor Cooper Owens. Thank you. I am so happy to be here, although I am saddened that I, I was unable to join all of you in California. Uh, I live in Lincoln, Nebraska, and we have literally experienced the four seasons in 24 hours. It was 91 degrees yesterday, no flurries this morning. We had a tornado warning, uh, showers, wind, I mean, you name it. So I, I certainly wish I was there with you. But first, I, I'd like to also thank uh, a number of Pitzer College colleagues. First, uh, President Melvin Oliver for thinking up this initiative. Also, Associate Dean uh, Pantajo, uh, thank you. Uh, the Planning Committee of the Racial Justice Institute and uh, Ermi Engineer Willoughby, who is a dear colleague of mine. Uh, I've known her for some years uh, and she is an amazing historian 
of medicine and science. Um, so I, I count count yourselves lucky students to be able to have someone like that in your community. And I'd also like to extend uh, gratitude for the assistance of colleagues I just met. I'm sorry, I don't know uh, everyone's name, but Scott and Chris who are helping with audio and visual. And so with that, that will be my cue to begin. So I'm going to now share my screen. And I often joke that, you know, I, I write about and I talk about dead bodies and dead people, right? And so how in the world am I kind of constantly crisscrossing the, the United States and sometimes other countries talking about 21st century issues, especially dealing with health inequities and health inequities that stem from uh, race and racism and, and gender and sex, right? And so as a historian, I like to contextualize. I like to give what I call intellectual genealogies. And so for the next few minutes, I wanna be able to walk us through this. So when I first began giving these, these talks, uh, almost five years ago when the book came out, I remember I would get questions about, you know, that was then, what about now? So I'm gonna start with the then, right? Medical racism in the, in the antebellum era. And so for most folk, we know that the 19th century largely was one that, you know, was an era. It was a time where the enslavement, the ownership of others was. It, it just was, right? Slavery was a, a very valuable economic labor system. And so it isn't hard to believe, uh, you know, that the, the presence of anti-Blackness or racism permeated societies at that time. So it's much easier for me to kind of ease people into those kinds of discussions. And so I start with a really interesting person. So I'm just gonna hold up my hand here. To my left, right, of my screen is Dr. Samuel Cartwright. Now he's pretty well known in history of medicine circles, not as well known in larger circles around American history. But the reason I chose Cartwright, and this is a, a plug, um, I do have a very dear colleague named uh, Christopher Willoughby, who wrote a really uh, pioneering article about Sam Cartwright. So if anybody's interested, it's in the Journal of Southern History. And he talks about his work uh, that I will discuss briefly. So Sam Cartwright is a pretty well-respected colleague. He's Southern born, he's educated in the North because during the time he, he enters med school, there are not a lot of medical schools in the South. And so Sam Cartwright comes back to the South. He establishes a, a good reputation and the Louisiana State Medical Association asks him to write an article, to conduct research about the distinctiveness of the Negro and the white race. And so Cartwright gets to work, he does this, and he publishes this article in 1851, right? This is 10 years before the Civil War starts. And in this article, Cartwright finds that indeed, there are biological differences between black people and white people. And he goes about listing them, almost providing a laundry list of, of those distinctive diseases that the Negro has a predisposition to either being infected with or, or, or getting. And so the most famous one is called Draper to mania. And he has a number of them that black people are more prone to dirt eating or clay eating, that they suffer from rascality, um, and herbitude, I mean, all, all of these kinds of things, right? Like if they're sassy, but the one that kind of catches on that we still talk about in the 21st century is this, this mental illness, he calls it, drapetomania. And it's essentially a disease that an enslaved person or a Negro, and in his case, he's using them as synonyms, if that person harbors the thought of running away or runs away from their, their plantation or slave farm, they're mentally ill. And so one might think, well, how in the world is that a distinctive Negro disease? Well, we have to think about the political context. People across the nation are engaged in debates about whether slavery is truly a good and civilizing force for Black people, or are Black people fit for freedom? And so Cartwright's work that is commissioned by the, the Louisiana State Medical Association 
fits neatly into those political debates and those kinds of contentious issues, right? Abolitionism is on the rise. And so now here is objective scientific proof that in fact, there is a biological difference between a black person and a white person. Now, if we move just 10 years later at the start of the civil war, and then you look to the right of my, my screen where I'm pointing with my hand, you see a cover of a book by a colleague, Lundy Braun, recently retired from Brown University, Lundy's a medical anthropologist. And Lundy conducted research on the images that you see. It's an image of a spirometer from the 19th century. What's the spirometer in fact is used today? It's an instrument that measures lung capacity. So you literally breathe into the machine. Now, Cartwright does not, he doesn't create this. He, he's not the inventor, but he does use the spirometer once again, doing this kind of binary racial comparative research between the Negro and the white race. And he wants to know, does the Negro have a lessened lung capacity? Is it diminished? He in fact finds that the Negro does have a lessened lung capacity. This work is so uh, instrumental in terms of the kind of black, white, racialized and medicalized studies that in fact we still see today. And, and, and you know, whenever we turn on the TVs or look at our smartphones, even read the papers, oftentimes when we talk about these health inequities or these gaps in, in race in racialized medicine, it's typically between black and white people, right? And so this is pioneering research in this way. So by 1861, once he finds that the Negro does in fact have a diminished lung capacity, we have to think the United States is actually engaged in the civil war in 1861. And guess what will end or remain at the end of the civil war? Slavery. And so there is a real interest in trying to find out whether freedom is fundamentally good for black people. And so the United States Sanitary Commission, which is a part of the US government, not the Confederate States, they start to commission experiments in, in, in medical slash scientific studies between white people and, and black people, or I should say white soldiers and, and Negro soldiers, trying to figure out where these differences lie, are there similarities? And they're using all kinds of instruments, one of uh, which is the spirometer. And this is the thing though, these are ideas that Sam Cartwright didn't create, the United States Sanitary Commission didn't create, they had been floating about, in fact, since the 18th century, since the rise of racial science. So these ideas that black people were more prone to uh, mental illness, if, they're, if they were free, black people didn't experience pain. Uh, black people had lessened lung capacity. All of these things about these biological differences that black people supposedly had comes about in the 18th century, right? With the rise of racialized science. And in fact, Cartwright is building upon earlier work. Thomas Jefferson in 1803, in his only book published, Notes on the State of Virginia, writes about the diminished lung capacity of the Negro. At the very end of the 18th century in 1799, Benjamin Rush, a founding father, who was considered the father of American medicine, some consider him the father of American psychiatry, writes that the Negro does in fact have lessened lung capacity and even provides detail that he says is, is observational that he sought, right? When other surgeons would amputate the limbs of the Negro. They were so insensible to pain that they would hold up their limbs, not knowing that they should cry out because they didn't feel it, right? So these ideas have been circulating for quite some, some time. Now, if we move over to medical racism now, this is where I always say, you know, I, I have a little, just a little teeny bit, little petty, petty part of my personality because I would always get a question, never asked publicly, always at the end of the talk, oh, I'm so, it's so horrible what happened to those enslaved women or those poor Irish women. But you know, doctors just don't listen to women at all. As if there was no legacy, no practice of anti-blackness or racism within the medical field. And so part of me addressing the now component was that we're still undergoing a lot of the retentions 
a lot of the ideologies or sets of beliefs that come from an earlier time period. So we're, you know, we don't blink an eye if I tell you that Sam Cartwright or a U.S. Uh, you know, government and army, you know, that that segregated black and white people believed black people had thicker skin or didn't experience pain or, you know, any number of things were more prone to lunacy as it was called or mental illness in the 19th century. We wouldn't blink an eye. But what if I told you through verifiable data that people believe it now? And so Kelly Hoffman in 2014 at the University of Virginia, along with her research team, decides she wants to have a study uh, of where she samples the University of Virginia's medical residents. So these are people who graduated medical college. They have undergraduate degrees and they are now in residency, right? They are special, uh, they're in training and really getting the specialization that they need to become uh, physicians. So she samples almost 300 of these students. And she essentially wants to know what are their views about the biological difference, alleged differences between the races, black and white people? What are their ideas around the perception of pain? And so she and her research team, she was in the Department of Psychology, she now has her PhD, but they go about and they create scenarios, in fact, identical scenarios, and they present them to these medical residents. And they wanna know, well, if a patient is experiencing kidney stones, really, really painful. I can tell you, my husband had them for the second time in four years. And it's one of the only times in my life I've seen him cry. I've known him for 24 years, right? They're extremely painful. Or childbirth. Now, I'm not a parent, but I've heard, you know, I, I've seen a, a couple of birthing sessions, not necessarily a walk in the park, right? So these are two recognized painful medical uh, conditions. And so she presents these to the residents, she and her team. Everything is identical except one patient experiencing kidney stones or going through childbirth is black, the other is white. Inevitably, overwhelming, these largely white medical residents believe that black people are not experiencing pain. If they are, it's minimal, or they're lying because they simply want to get narcotics or drugs. And then there are other things that emerge. Black people have thicker skin. Black people have a, a predisposition to aging faster. Two of the residents even believe Black people were born with tails. So it's published two years later and makes a huge splash. Now, this is the thing. It's not the first study of its kind to be published in the 21st century. And if we think about the ideas that people who have committed themselves to do no harm, right? That's the oath that they have to take, the Hippocratic oath to do no harm and think about these harmful ideas. Now that you, know, you had your, your Dean of RGI, RJI, uh, Professor Willoughby, myself, we all have taught about these kinds of things. And I can tell you that in the humanities and the social sciences and even the hard sciences, one of the things I know for sure, I would pay anybody to find a book published in the 21st century or even the late 20th century, I'd say from mid to late 20th century, where you would find any scholar or academic or researcher who says, oh, race is biological. It's a biological construct. We don't. We know that it's a social construct. That in fact, the categorization of race has changed over time, even when people's parentage hasn't changed, right? That one can be born to a black parent or a white parent, and at one point is considered black or white or mulatto in the 18th or 19th century or biracial in the 21st century. The parentage has never changed. The US's categorization of that person's race has changed. And in fact, if I were to have a, a, a positive match for blood with someone who looked different than me and existed in a different racial category, we could give each other blood. We could donate blood to each other because Humans are 99 point, bump like blink, 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 blink percent more similar than dissimilar, right? And the thing is, these students know this. They have, they have B, BSs, I say that tongue in cheek, right? They have bachelor's of science degrees. They're entering into one of the country's top ranked medical schools. In fact, I did my postdoc at UVA. 
people from the United, uh, University of Virginia think very highly of themselves in their schools, founded by Thomas Jefferson in the 18th century. These are not folk who, you know, coming in there with lackluster grades and mediocre MCAT scores. And they have a degree from an undergraduate institution. And yet they have willingly chose to disavow all that they've learned about biology and the science of race. And they chose to believe in anti-Blackness. And so that is the thing that for me is frightening, right? Why would you choose to believe that Black people don't experience pain when you know that your patients are human beings? They're not a different species or that Black people are born with tails, right? Or all, all of these kinds of things that, that would fit nicely in the antebellum era or the, or the 18th century. And so that's where, as a historian, it's my role to provide context and fill in those historical gaps to explain why these inequities have happened. And so part of that for me is really kind of busting these either or uh, framings of people from our past and these exceptionality narratives. What do I mean by that? When my book first came out and there was a lot of controversy around the country um, really created by college students around the legacy of Confederate soldiers, uh, largely. But in New York, where I lived at the time, uh, there was a grassroots effort by people who lived in East Harlem near Central Park to have the statue of James Marion Sims, known as the father of American gynecology, removed from the park. So my book comes out at this kind of precipitous moment, you know, where people in the nation are, are really battling around symbols and legacies and the ways that journalists would approach me would always be, well, what do you think? Should the statue stay or remain in Central Park? But the other question was, well, was he a savior or a monster? Did he butcher the reproductive organs of enslaved women? And as a historian, I knew it was a bit more complex than that. So I never played nice, right? Of course, like anybody else, I believe in, in symbols and I know they are important but I didn't want to amplify my voice because I wasn't a resident of East Harlem. I lived in Brooklyn at the time. And also the grassroots organizers and community members, I think needed to, to be the ones to lead that conversation. I was much more interested in educating people about the 19th century, about US slavery, and also about the legacy of these pioneering physicians in obst uh, obstetrics and gynecology. And so a part of that was because, right, people typically learned if they don't have this kind of privilege of being in, in a college classroom, most folk get their information about slavery and even the antebellum era from popular culture, TV, movies, sometimes novels, which are they're, they're not monographs, right? They're not history books. They're the creative works of fiction, sometimes based on the past, but they're still creative works of fiction, right? They're made up. And they don't often have an expert in a certain time period or a labor system who's able to, to contextualize things. So I never answered those questions because they were wrong. And I also knew that the way that so much of American history had been taught was always who's the first Right? Who did this exceptional thing? Who were the mothers or the fathers? And I wanted to, to really have us grapple with that and think differently. So I had to take the pros and the cons. And trust me, there were people who fell on either side. Not a whole lot on the pro side, I have to say. But you had folk, there is an MD PhD named Dr. Lewis Wall, and he's written a number of articles really in defense of Sims's legacy, right? Because he's saying a lot of the criticisms of Sims is, you know, they are rooted in the 21st century. So these, you know, these critiques that he gave, uh, didn't give enslaved women anesthesia, or, you know, he didn't ask for their consent. That's wrongheaded, right? Because he was a product of the 19th century. And in fact, in some of his articles, Dr. Wall has argued that in fact, Sims was benevolent. He took care of these sick women. And he had about eight or nine enslaved women that he experimented on um, in a, a little less than five years, but he took care of them, brought them from, from their, their plantations and farms and housed them in his hospital and worked on them until they were healed. And I was like, 
he, he did some of that, but it probably wasn't because he was compassionate, right? He's an MD, PhD in the history of medicine who didn't understand slavery. He didn't understand the business of slavery. A person like Sims, who was a slave owner, he was a Southerner, Sims would have gone to owners and said, hey, I can lease your slaves. I'm going to take them at cost and I'm going to work on them until I can find a cure or fix them in 19th century language. And guess what? They say, okay, because you have someone who's essentially leasing property. Even though we're talking about enslaved people, legally they were defined as chattel or movable property. And in fact, it was a practice as old as slavery in this country was. People leased all kinds of property. In fact, we still do. We lease cars and apartments, even our labor, if we work at temp agencies. So this is not a practice that was new. And this was certainly not one that was attendant upon one's benevolence or compassion. He was simply working within the economic labor system and its practices that had already been established, right? Because Sims, as a Southerner and a slave owner, knew the engine of US slavery, especially in the 19th century, couldn't move without the healthy births of black babies to enslaved women. Why was that important? Because as early as the 1620s, British colonial legislators said, you know what? We have a lot of white men impregnating enslaved women. We're losing money. And this is a pretty profitable economic labor system. And so they literally reverse a law that had been practiced in Britain for thousands of years. And they reverse this law based on an ancient one from the, the Greco-Roman world. And it was called Partus Secretar Ventrum. The child inherits the condition of the mother's womb. So if the mother is enslaved, the child is enslaved. So it doesn't matter if that child's father is a president like Thomas Jefferson or a slave owner, that child inherits the condition of the mother, which is bondage, not that of the father. And so it ensures that slavery will continue, right? It had not ever been done in the British Empire. And now in this colony, and in fact, in most British colonies, it was happening except for Barbados. So this is why Sims is really attendant to making sure that these women have healthy pregnancies and can give birth. And he wants to fix them. Now, on the opposite side, you have those who are saying Sims is a, a butcher. He's a monster. He was excessively cruel. He didn't give them anesthesia. He intentionally addicted them to opiates. He didn't ask their consent. And so I'm saying, if, I, if, if my premise for academic text based in the 19th century was on informed consent, which wasn't practiced by doctors in the US until the 1980s, as a, I mean, as a real practice, it, it existed on the page. It wasn't really practiced and embraced until the 1980s. And so if I did that, I wouldn't have a book that was published. Because you don't ask chattel for consent. Legally, they're not considered human beings. And what enslaved person is going to say, yeah, you know, I think I'm, I'm going to leave here. You know, I'll risk getting beaten or sold or, you know, maybe worse. I'll risk leaving here so you can experiment on me surgically for a number of years in a place where I don't know anybody. It, it, it can't happen. That's not how a world comprised of free people and enslaved people work. This idea too that, well, well, you know, anesthesia existed, why didn't he use it? Most surgeons in the 1840s did not use anesthesia because anesthesiology as a medical branch didn't exist. So let's say you give somebody, you know, anesthesia, you don't know if they're gonna wake up from it. So the, the easiest way for a surgeon to know the patient is alive, you restrain that patient with your two surgical assistants, always male, you know, in most cases, and the patient is held down and the surgery occurs. That's how it worked, right? This idea too that, oh, he gave them opiates and he was intentionally drugging them. An overdependency on opiates might've occurred because the surgeries lasted for a number of years. However, what we know about addiction or overdependency now in the 21st century, very different. Surgeons use opium or opiates 
for surgical patients because it stopped, it, it essentially created a stoppage. You became constipated. Sims was attempting to repair obstetrical fistula. This was a, 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 an injury, a soft tissue injury caused by prolonged labor, very common in the 19th century, called vesicle vaginal fistula. These women are literally in childbirth for days, two, three days, sometimes longer. And they are trying to expel the fetus. They're trying, they're pushing, they're pushing. Nothing happens except the sloughing off of the soft tissue in the upper vaginal area creates a fistula or hole. Up above it is the bladder. Guess what happens in continence? And if there's ripping in the back, if you know what I mean, there's incontinence there. It's not deadly, but infections, there's a stench. You're ostracized because of the smell, all of those kinds of things. So he's trying to repair that. Guess what? If you suture or stitch that and you give someone opium, they're going to be constipated. And you don't want that, that suture, right, that stitching to open up. So it's a practical reason. It's not about addiction. So once I can get folk on that page, then I come up with this question. Was Sims actually exceptional in his treatment of enslaved women? And the entire chapter of my first book says, nope, he wasn't. And I know folk want to act like he was exceptionally cruel. He wasn't. This man literally was doing what everybody else who looked like him was doing. And so I start off with a man who was French born, who did work on a woman that we know today as the hot and top Venus, but she was a South African woman born enslaved, sold uh, by her owner to his brother and an Englishman. She then is sent to England, later sold to an animal keeper in France. And this is where the story becomes more interesting for me as a historian of medicine. Bartman was this kind of, uh, she was a, a confounding figure because people loathed her as this African woman who they called Hottentot, which is a very pejorative name for, for South African women. And the reason they said Venus, you know, was almost like a joke. Like how in the world could a Hottentot be beautiful like Venus? Right, so it was this, this really horrible name. And the reason that people were infatuated with her or either loathed her, right? It was, it was kind of you know, this duality that existed for a lot of Europeans who encountered Bartman because of the size of her buttocks. So one might say, well, how does that have anything to do with medicine? I'll tell you. Doctors and scientists all of a sudden said because she had large buttocks, and I can tell you, I lived in South Africa, 22 years ago, she was shaped like many South African women that I saw. Nothing out of the ordinary, right? Nothing out of the ordinary. But all of a sudden, having a big butt is now pathologized and it becomes a medical term, steatopegia, excessive enlargement of the buttocks. That's still used today. And so Cuvier, once Bartman dies, she does not live a good life. She dies in her early 20s. He can now find out that she really is the missing link between the primate and a human being. And he commenced to performing an autopsy on her death. And guess what he finds? She's a regular human being, or was, I should say, because it's her death. And so he removes her skeleton, cleans it up, puts it on display in the National Museum of Paris. Because while she was living in that museum, under his care, I use it in air quotes, she was housed in a menagerie. That's where you kept plants and animals. And so her bones are put on display. He cuts out her genitalia, cuts out her brain, preserves those, puts them in bell jars. And so, the, you know, there's this way that for me, as someone who's interested in slavery and interested in women's history and medicine, I'm saying, oh my gosh, this is one of the exemplars or models for how Black bodies, whether they're alive, or not, right? A, there's an afterlife in those reproductive parts. People are trying to produce knowledge, right? There's a kind of medicalization that's going on. And she's also displayed, not just for curiosity's sake, right? She's certainly, her, her body parts are certainly a curio, you know, as they were called back then, a curio object. But there's also this sense that we can see if in fact these Negroes are, are different. And that treatment, right, that kind of value in the afterlife of enslaved people's body parts travels across the Atlantic world. And by the time we get to a very young nation in 
America, um, you know, in a state called Kentucky, which was considered the West. Efren McDowell, the father of the Ovariotomy, kind of appears on the scene. And most people haven't heard of him. But if you go to YouTube, there's an ABC afternoon special called The Long Ride on His Life, right? produced in the late 70s or 80s. Efren McDowell puts America on the global map because in 1809, he becomes known as the father of the Ovariotomy. He performs the first successful abdominal incision and the patient survives. He removes an ovary, ovarian tumor of 20 pounds on a white woman. She survived. She's middle aged like me. When he does it, she lives to be a senior citizen in her 70s. And he, you know, at, at the beginning stage, because she lives, and this is so rare and uncommon, surgeries are rare, but especially people surviving. And it's the first known case that we know of, right, that's been reported. So he commences to finding other patients, experimental patients. Guess what he finds? At least four or five Black women all of whom were enslaved except for one. And over the next few years, he performs experiments. Four of them survive, one doesn't. He publishes an article. And in that article, this is what was interesting for me. Because the experimental part, by this point, I'm sold. I know that access to enslaved bodies allows for the development of this branch of medicine. I don't have, you know, I, I see it everywhere in all of these medical journals and textbooks and notes. So that part, I'm, I'm pretty sold on. What's amazing to me, though, is the response he receives globally in the Lancet. Medical journal still in existence today, some would argue the most prominent medical journal in the, in the Western world. A Dr. Johnson from Britain says, well, of course, these negresses would have survived because these women could, they could endure cutting with the impunity of uh, uh, dogs and rabbits. So comparing them to animals that A, reproduce fast, but also, and they don't really experience pain, they're negresses. So some folks argue that James Marion Sims was somehow so brilliant or, or either evil that he created this idea that black people, black women in particular didn't experience pain. And I'm like, no, no, no. In the early 19th century, you had people in Britain writing about this, right? Writing about this, based on the surgeries of an American doctor who does this on enslaved women. John Peter McTower, by the 1830s, 10 years, you know, almost a decade before Sims's experiments, he performs the same kind of obstetrical fistula surgeries or VVF, vesco-vaginal fistula. He's known as the father of American plastic surgery because of some cleft palate work he had done. But he's a slave owner, and that's the thing, so is McDowell, right? All of these men are. And he performs experimental surgery, white woman, black woman, suffering from this fistula. And the white woman survives. He, he comes up with a silk suture method. So he uses silk material, which is pretty strong and sturdy, stitches her up, right? Sutures her. The white woman survives. He does it to the enslaved woman at the same technique, which is interesting with black and white people are supposed to be different, but I digress, right? Same surgical technique. Guess what? She's not, she's not here. He tries it for eight trials over a number of years. She's not healed. And when he finally publishes his article in the 1830s, he writes in frustration in this article, the patient could have been healed had she stopped engaging in sexual intercourse. Guess what, Matawa? You are a Virginia slave owner. You know good and well that enslaved people cannot stop engaging in sexual intercourse, especially if it is forced. Guess what an amazing fact that's attended to this. Most African-Americans, if not all, who have ancestors that go back to US slavery, we all have a percentage of European ancestry because it was quite common for white men and some white women to engage in illicit interracial sex with Negroes. So you're not going to find a Black person in America who has ancestors that are linked to the U.S. slavery that, that don't have European ancestry. It, the system of slavery was built on that. He knows she can't control that. And yet he blames her. A practice that still goes on with this patient blaming. Negative medical outcome, it's the patient's fault. Even though slavery is what we would consider a negative social determinant, much in the same ways with Cartwright, saying, oh my gosh, these people are out here eating clay. 
They have less in lung capacity. Well, slave cabins and huts weren't insulated. Lots of people often lived in very small spaces. They weren't well ventilated and they had huge chimneys in there with smoke that filled up the space. Sometimes they didn't have windows. How in the world are people gonna have healthy lungs in that environment? Slavery becomes a neg negative social determinant, right? People eat clay and dirt when they have low iron. They don't have diverse vitamins and nutrients and minerals in their diets. So the patient is blamed as if they're mentally ill or their bodies are biologically inferior as opposed to the system that creates it, right? This continues to this day. Francois-Marie Prevost, father of the cesarean section. French-born like Cuvier goes to Haiti uh, in 1799 and he sets about experimenting on enslaved women from Haiti. Guess what? He recognizes that there might be a revolution brewing so he skips across the pond to America and he settles in a former French colony that's now a part of the state, uh, Louisiana. And what he finds uh, you know, he, he's, he's looking around, he's in this slave state, he's a slave owner, he experiments on two enslaved women and performs a C-section. Amazingly, they live. This is in the 1830s. He's credited as the second American man to perform C-sections. This is the really interesting thing. So when people say, well, medical racism now? I said, let me give you a little story about Provost. He performs these surgeries in, 1830, uh, in the 1830s, from the 1830s until the 21st century, guess what state has the, the highest disproportionate use of black women and birthing people for C-sections in the entire nation, including Washington, DC, Louisiana. Guess what state from the 19th century, from the 1830s, all the way to the 21st century until about two or three years ago was number one in terms of uh, C-section use of black women, Louisiana. Uh, Mississippi finally knocked them to number two. Mississippi is considered the blackest state in the nation because it has, it has the highest concentration of African-Americans in terms of its population. Guess what state has the highest rates of black maternal mortality, morbidity, black infant mortality and morbidity, Louisiana. But guess who everybody wanted to talk about, Sims. And here I was saying, wait, this is not about one lone person who was exceptional. This is about literally branches of medicine that helped to create a structure and a system based on slavery and inequality and anti-Blackness. And those effects are still happening today. And folk are focusing on the, on the one person. And so as a historian, I'm saying, no, 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 no. We can talk about the person, but wouldn't it be better to talk about the institutions, right? Because then we can possibly pivot and start to think about the ways that we can change the narrative and also those statistics. Now, by the time we get to, to Sims, the father of American gynecology, you all know, I explained earlier, he's experimenting on enslaved women in Montgomery, Alabama. In fact, according to his own memoir, and I used his book, uh, as my footnote, he talks about, you know, creating a hospital where he would work on these cases on enslaved women trying to repair fistula. He finally does. It's about a three and a half, four year process at the last half of the experimental, uh, uh, experimental trial that he's using these eight or nine black women. He owns or leases 17 enslaved people. He is, he literally has, uh, he's been, you know, quit, you know, in some ways, you know, his two white male surgical assistants are like, you keep, you know, failing with these surgeries, nothing good is happening. I don't even know if you're, you're really, you know, doing good work or experimenting on them like guinea pigs. We quit, we're tired of this, we're losing money. Folk are laughing at us, you know, we're losing support. So he makes the enslaved patients who he's experimenting on his surgical nurses. This is the interesting thing. When they become his surgical nurses, and essentially his surgical assistant, he finally gets the surgical reparative technique right. They help him develop it. And this is a really interesting thing where I say, ah, you know, there's a racial cognitive dissonance that goes on. They're illiterate, unlike the two white male surgical assistants quit 
Enslaved people, Black people, were not supposed to be literate. That's according to the law. They're women. They're not supposed to be logical or rational because women are ruled by their uteri. And they have too many nerves, which makes them, you know, nervous and irrational and illogical. And they're also Black. People who are, who are supposedly in a state of intellectual arrested development. And yet this is a surgical team that helps him get it, right? And so this is the other thing too. He's using black women that are supposedly different than white people to cure all women. So there are lots of these moments of cognitive dissonance. And Sims, as a slave owning Southern born physician, he knows that these people are human beings. He knows, in fact, one of the women during the trial is impregnated by a white man and gives birth to a mulatto baby listed on the census. You don't impregnate a duck or a goat or a chair, right? Other chattel or movable property, but you can impregnate an enslaved person because you know it's a human being. But because of the racial ideology or set of beliefs, the racial etiquette of the day, despite one's practice, they still have to write with the embrace of anti-Blackness. So they, he can, you know, someone can say they don't experience pain. Well, if that's the case, why do they have to be restrained? Because if these people didn't experience pain, you wouldn't restrain them like you did white people. None of it makes sense, and they know it. But also in the South, abolitionist literature is illegal. You can't write, you can't even write things that are factual if it seems as if black and white people are equal. So this is also the world that informs a lot of these pioneering physicians that I that I mentioned. The other thing that slavery allows is the development of medical technology and tools. This, the SIM speculum, this kind of double bill speculum is still in use today, it's still called the SIM speculum. And he develops it because of his access to these enslaved women's bodies. Right? So slavery also helps in terms of medical entrepreneurship for these, for these folks, right? And he can attach his name to it. They can get patents, they can sell these things, right? They can be honored every time someone says, hey, hand me the Sims speculum, right? It's an invocation of Sims's name and his legacy. And yet, you know, when I was first starting my, my dissertation research many, many years ago, I would have people who would say, are you sure there's enough? Maybe you can produce a, a pamphlet. I don't know if you even have enough for an article. Because these folk had literally been effaced. What does that mean? There was an erasure. So there'd be articles written by all of those doctors that I named, and guess what? The illustrations would often have white nurses, white patients, right? Even though the text would say the negress, the servitor, the slave. So people, they often believe the pictures and not necessarily the words. And so there was literally this erasure happening, right, in the illustrations. And so what that created, right, was this way you know, by the end of slavery in 1865, where you didn't have an interest in maintaining uh, Black women's reproductive health, all of a sudden, the very things that enslaved women were praised for, right, they were now critiqued. Oh, they're, they're welfare queens, they're sexually immoral, they're crack users who produce crack babies, they don't go to, to their doctor's appointments, they're fed. I mean, all of these things were the mother's fault, right? And nobody ever looked at the practice of medicine and how it started. And so the legacy that we're left with, with in this nation, the United States is the most dangerous nation in the, in the quote unquote high income earning world for black women or birthing people to become pregnant and give birth three to four times more likely. In some places that number rises eight times more likely like when I lived in Brooklyn, 13 times more likely like in states like Mississippi and Louisiana. But there is a way that Black women are beginning to claim these historical legacies and to tell different stories and to invoke the names of the folk that we do know who helped usher in develop, uh, these developments. The mothers of gynecology. We know the names of only three of Sims's patients. The sculptures that you see to my left are create, were created by Michelle Browder to my right. And she has literally, literally taken this picture in the shadow of Sims in Montgomery, Alabama, her birthplace and also the birthplace of American gynecology. And she wanted to give a, a new uh, invocation and legacy to these women who had as much knowledge as any pioneering surgeon in the 19th century and who actually served with Sims as his research team. 
another way that Black women have decided to proclaim legacies, especially as we are in the middle of Black Maternal Health Week, which I think is really, really fitting for the inauguration of this uh, racial justice uh, initiative. And I'm talking about these kinds of, of uh, historical facts and contempor uh, contemporaneous facts. Kimberly Seals Allers is the founder of Black Breastfeeding Week, but also the founder of Earth App. And you can go on social media, you can download it on your, your Android, on your Apple phone. And what it does, because there had not been a lot of data that tracked the experiences of black and brown birthing people. She says, wait a minute, I can create an app where people can tell us about the doctors who treated us well, the hospitals where the, the stats are alarming. You know, we can, we can put this into a portal and we can track it and we can, we can make these people in these institutions accountable. And the other thing that gives me hope in terms of academia, Remember, I started with uh, Dr. Hoffman. I'm gonna end with Dr. Rachel Hardiman. She is an African-American public health scholar at the University of Minnesota. And she looked through almost 2 million records in a Florida hospital, just one, from the late 20th century to the 21st century, and found that in Florida, in all of these births, if the black birthing person had a provider who looked like them, and that means pediatricians, neonatal, uh, neonatologists, OBGYNs, I mean, lactation specialists, doulas, midwives, if the provider looked like them, the mortality rate and the morbidity rate cut by over 50%, because guess what? It was never race, because that's the social construct. It was always about whether these folk had to deal with that challenge of medical racism or anti-Blackness. And so I'll end here because I want to, I see that there are some questions in the Q&A, but I'll end here with saying this gives me hope that we can transform these numbers that in 20 years, when if, if there's ever, you know, 25 year commemoration of medical bondage, I can say, you know, in the early part of my career, I was given lots of talks at medical schools and schools of nursing and grand rounds and public health schools and universities and colleges and, and groups about this you know, really horrible statistic. And yet it's, it's not something that we contend with anymore. That would be my hope that we can really have these, these black women and their children and birthing people become the objects of our compassion who require quality care. And so I thank you for your time and your attention to RJI and Pizza College. And I welcome all of your questions and your comments. Thank you. Thank you, um, thank you, Professor Cooper Owens. That was um, really that was really um, fascinating, and, and um, some of it was hard to to hear. But I thought, um, yeah, there are there are some questions in the queue. Mm -hmm. um, I will go ahead and um, start with the first one from uh, Bianca Howell. Uh, she asks, Are there instruments in the OBGYN practice today? that have roots in the history of experimentation on black women. What is your opinion on whether instruments like this should still be used? Yeah, um, I mean, the instruments are inanimate, right? Um, so yes, I mean, most people point to the sim speculum. Um, that's, that's the most well-known um, that was developed uh, initially using two pewter spoons on one of the enslaved women uh, in Sims's, um, in his, his hospital in uh, Alabama. So there, there are initiatives to rename those tools, um, for sure. I do think that um, we, should, we should actually rely a bit less on vaginal examinations and speculums when they are not necessary. They are not necessary for things like the, um, you know, whether a, a physician should determine whether one needs birth control. Uh, family histories tend to be more important. You can even take MRIs, x-rays to find blood clots, those kinds of things. And so vaginal examinations are overused. And that's when you start getting into the use of these kinds of speculums, whether it's the gray speculum or the sin speculum. And so um, that's what I would say. There needs to be a, a real reckoning and pivoting of why we're so reliant on these kinds of tools when um, they actually aren't as precise and they don't provide the best um, view 
in the, the, the internal vaginal area for physicians anyway. They don't have lights. There are literally things that clink and clank. And you have to tighten screws on all, all speculi, you know, speculi for the, for the most part. So um, that's a great question. Thank you. Thank you, Bianca. And um, please uh, go ahead and type any questions that you have into the, the Q&A um, the, the Q &A box. Um, the next question we have comes from Kyle Greenspan, who asks, um, I'm curious what medical knowledge or tools are still in use today that have the most direct link to this history of medical racism in your view? Yeah, thank you for that, Kyle. Um, you know, I mean, I spoke about the speculum, but you know, there there are these ideas. I think that um, you know, physicians and doctors have that black people are just lying about pain. I mean, there are so many studies now that have shown this, and that's the thing. Statistically, in terms of just the numbers of black people in this country, most black people have a much more conservative use around narcotic drugs than white people. So the numbers tend to be fewer, actually, but also percentage-wise. Um, alcohol use is about, it's, it's typically about even in, in terms of adults, but there's this knowledge that somehow black folk are just lying um, about these things. Um, there is also the use of the spirometer, um, you know, in terms of lung assessments, but this is the thing where it gets really tricky, chip, uh, tricky, excuse me. There are other, you know, the, the, the uh, tools around um, renal failure, the possibility of renal failure conditions for black people with kidneys, all of these things exist and they're based on these out, like outdated and really dangerous um, sets of knowledge and data that should not be relied on, that should not be used, that also affects black people in terms of higher prices for insurance premiums because of pre-existing conditions that sometimes don't even exist. So if I breathe into a spirometer today and a white person breathed into a spirometer and our readings were the same, a, a clinician or a practitioner has to adjust the dial for me as a black person. Not because my reading was different, but because that's just the general practice and belief. So those are the kinds of things that, that are believed um, that, we, that we need to get rid of that are dangerous. Um, you know, so, so people are finally talking about it, writing articles about it. There are advocacy groups. A lot of medical organizations have spoken, you know, spoken out of, against some of these practices. For example, ACOG or the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, they've spoken, about, uh, spoken out against the kind of overuse and reliance of vaginal examinations. Um, they have, with the, the help of a doctor called Veronica uh, Pimentel, a, a Black woman born in West Africa in Cape Verde, uh, they have helped to create and memorialize an Anaka Betsy Lucy Day as a bridge between Black History Month and Women's History Month. There are learning modules that are being created. I do a lot of consultancy work with these kinds of organizations and schools in terms of curriculum design. So people are you know, beginning to recognize that they also have to turn the lens on themselves and recognize what practices are harmful, what tools are harmful for their patients. Thank you, Kyle. Yeah, that's, that's um, a really good question. And it's, it's really curious to me why there's still that adjustment in the spirometer when it seems so obviously uh, flawed. Exactly. Um, uh, our next question is from an anonymous attendee. Um, they ask, how does accountability work with apps like Earth that are looking just at the positives, but how can we ensure that those that are failing, still providing racial practices, be held accountable and ensure that they change their practices to be at least not racist and moved towards anti-racist? So I think um, in, in no way is Earth about just looking at positives. No, the positive, and, and so maybe I need to, to kind of reframe the way I articulated that. The positive is that Kimberly Seals Allers created her so that those harmful institutions and doctors can be held uh, accountable. So this is the thing. There's really no data tracking around accountability for doctors and in institutions or nurses or lacta lactation specialists. There's, there are none for the most part. So what she's attempting to do is to say, let this be a repository where data can be tracked, where we know all of the experiences, 
So if you've had a horrible experience at a hospital a year after year after year has these really, you know, horrible um, statistics that are, are killing birthing people and children that are creating more harm, sometimes intentional, sometimes unintentional, we need to know about it. So it's gonna be a data tracking system that, that should, hopefully, fingers crossed, you know, that should cover all of that, right? It should be a repository for, for all of that. And what it actually does, you know, from the historical standpoint is, you know, it is about the institution building that Black people have had to do because of these anti-Black institutions. So sometimes, you know, I do a lot of talks in February and March. Guess why? I'm Black if you haven't told. I mean, if you haven't been able to tell. And I'm also a woman if you haven't been able to tell. I even have she, her in my, in my uh, pronouns. The thing is, though, I often say, you know, during February, because I always get somebody, well, how did Black people have these historically Black colleges? You're saying you're proud of them. I was like, uh, they're largely in the South because when slavery was over, white Southerners did not want integration. And so guess what they did in states like Mississippi and South Carolina and Georgia and Tennessee and Alabama and Louisiana. I could go on and on. They created laws that said Black people and white people couldn't integrate. And so what are you going to do if you can't go to the school that your tax dollars pay for? you got to create your own. Right. So they literally institution built. And that's what Kimberly Seals Alice is doing. She's con you know, continuing that, that tradition. And, and by doing that, she's also setting the rules for how the data can be tracked, how these, you know, how these, these people um, who look like me can also be in control of the narrative, right? And the information sharing. So I hope I, I hope I clarified that for you. Thanks so much for that question. Yeah, good question. And it kind of speaks to the, the need just for more um, medical education and opportunities to have more Black healthcare professionals it seems as a good um, a move in a good direction. Um, our next question comes from Feli Katan. Um, she says, uh, thank you, Dr. Owens, for this wonderful talk. Could you talk about Black responses to these studies in the 19th, um, in the 19th century? I'm thinking about Haitian doctors um, like Joseph Atunor Fermin and Jean Price Mars, who contested this scientific racism. Also, if you can talk more about the global implications, um, since slavery is an Atlantic phenomenon. Uh, you mentioned Cuvier. What was the importance of collaboration between white doctors in the Western world and reversely between Black scientists in the diaspora? Okay, thank you. I'm hoping. Feli, I hope I'm, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing your name uh, correctly or incorrectly, so I apologize if it is wrong. I, that, those are questions that are great. They, are, they fall really outside of my field of expertise. I mean, in, in some ways, the myopia of being a U.S. historian in the United States is, you know, I don't necessarily engage with a lot of Atlantic world texts because I'm a, a kind of tried and true antebellum era historian. And so even when I look at the colonial space, I'm largely looking at British North America that becomes the United States. And so in the spaces where I'm looking, there are not a lot of writings that are coming out of the South. Um, there are not a lot of black doctors who are publishing. There are a lot of publications that will not allow for it. And so most of those publications in the US are coming out post slavery. You know, They're coming out in the emancipation era. So I, I don't have enough knowledge you know, to speak about those, the, the Haitian physicians that you named. Um, there were, of course, you know, abolitionists, um, Black abolitionists who were vocal in newspapers. And there were a number of Black abolitionist newspapers, not necessarily medical journals, that talked about all manner of things. And so you had Black people who were contesting um, you know, the kind of scientific racism of the 1840 census. So folk like Andrew Jackson, I'm sorry, excuse me, um, oh, John C. Calhoun, sorry, wrong, wrong South Carolina. Um, John C. Calhoun, you know, famous for the cornerstone speech. He is the architect of the secession movement or, or states' rights ideology. You have Black abolitionists who are, who are contesting what he and some of these other racist uh, scientists are saying who were like, well, you know, in the North, what we're finding in the census is there are more, uh, you know, insane Black people than insane Black people in the South. 
And this proves that, you know, uh, you know slavery is a, a, a necessary good. You know, it's a civilizing force. And there are a number of black folk who are writing in abolitionist uh, newspapers in the North who are saying, this is hogwash. There's even a white statistician who is like, you all cook these numbers, you bake them. They're not, they're not reliable. Um, so there, there, there have always been folk, you know, acting out about this. The thing is, because I'm a historian of, of US slavery, the 4 million, you know, nearly 4 million people who are undergoing these oppressive systems and treatment, they're, they're illiterate for the most part. They are not leaving records. And so unfortunately, what I have to do is piece together their lives and their experiences from the very folk who own them, who experimented on them. Um, and that becomes a challenge you know, in, in doing US slavery. And so I'm also not an Atlanticist, um, but I can, I can certainly point you to works, um, you know, Atlanticists like Marisa Fuentes and Jennifer Morgan, even Sadia Hartman, who's not really a historian of medicine, but she's more of an Atlanticist than me. Um, Sasha Turner, these are folk who are writing about the Atlantic world because they're, they're Atlantic historians um, in ways that I'm not. So thank you for that. And I, I don't have the answers um, just because it's not my field. Yeah, thank you, Faley, for that really good question. And I would add um, the work of, of Rana Hogarth, who um, yeah. talks about the circulation or writes about the circulation of medical knowledge in the Atlantic world. But I think that, you know, there is kind of a, a, a linguistic issue that kind of, it would be good for there to be more research from someone who can get into the Francophone Atlantic world and make yeah. those connections. Yeah. Um, we have another question here from an anonymous attendee, uh, Dr. Cooper Owens. Uh, thank you for your amazing work as an aspiring historian. I'm interested in hearing more about navigating medical education spaces as a historian of medicine. Are medical schools, or so physicians, sincerely interested in their own history? Yeah, you know, this is, so it is interesting. I, and that's a great question. Um, I was on a panel, maybe, oh gosh, it probably was the fall, late fall, maybe early winter. And it was with Harriet Washington, who wrote uh, a book called Medical Apartheid. And it was written almost 10 years prior to, to my book's publication. And I remember someone from the audience said, has there been a lot of resistance to your work by medical professionals? And she had a very different experience in 2007, 2008. She said, yes, it was tough. I remember when her book came out, my, I, in fact, her book came out the same year I finished my dissertation, I graduated. And I remember it was a damning, like a scathing critique of her, her book in the New York Times. And it was written by a historian. And in, in many ways it was unfair because Harriet Washington is a trained journalist. She's not a historian. And so she also wrote for a trade press. Editors and trade presses are interested not in getting someone tenure because she's not she wasn't an academic right she was a, a health journalist and so they're interested in getting numbers and possibly getting some prizes right so folk can know those authors' names and this historian who is an academic literally reviews her book as a, a academic text and so it was scathing and so she received those kinds of things. I have received in a decade the opposite. I have been asked to do grand rounds. I have been asked to sit on boards. I am asked to do consulting work. I am asked to do curriculum design because I think particularly when you have these long statistics that prove that black folk weren't lying then or now about medical racism because we are still in a black birthing crisis. I mean, the numbers, are not even getting better, they're getting worse. The CDC almost four weeks ago came out with more damning numbers. And not only are the numbers worse for black folk, guess who's also experiencing these really negative numbers? White birthing people. And so maybe the US will pay attention. So I think when you have those kinds of numbers, people are like, come on in. So I've gotten a totally different response. Um, and so I do find that these medical schools, and I'm talking about prominent ones, they're, I, 
there's not been an Ivy outside of maybe Cornell that I haven't spoken to. I've spoken at various schools of nursing, various schools of uh, uh, giving grand rounds at various hospitals. And I'm talking from, from big to, to small, um, all across the nation. And they are very interested in this because they didn't have the answers to know, you know why they were being blamed <laughs> by parents and, and black women activists in particular. And now they know, and now they see the connections between some of those harmful practices that doctors were creating in the 18th and 19th century that they're still using. You shouldn't be blaming patients that, because of a negative medical outcome. We need to have a better con context around the social determinants of health. And this is a long way of me answering this and I, I promise I'll, I'm gonna try and say it as briefly as I can. I grew up in high school in a very poor rural community in South Carolina, it's in the low country. So my people are called Gullah Geechee people. We're the, the black group in America that has the closest ties to West Africa because of the South Carolina Sea Islands. So in these groups, it was really prosperous during slavery, not so prosperous after slavery. My high school's mascot was called the Golden Bowl Weevil. That was a cotton bug that destroyed cotton crops. And I, my high school was also across from a cotton field just to give you a sense of where I, I grew up and where I went to school. The white folk did not want their children after Brown v. Board happened to go to school with black people once integration became a thing. And so they created an academy for white students. And that persisted until very recently when they started to lose money and said, oh, oh I guess some black folk can come, right? And I mean, very recent, within the last 10 years. So I grew up in that kind of environment. When I graduated high school in 1990, in this poor, small Southern black community, OBGYN ward closed. Guess what? Our hospital never had, they never opened up another. So if you are, and my county is almost 80% black, if you have a baby, you can't have a baby in King Street, South Carolina and Williamsburg Regional Hospital. You gotta go to the next town over Lake City, 13 miles away. If there are complications, you can go to possibly Florence, almost 40 miles away. And if there is a life or death situation, you will have to be helicoptered to Charleston, almost 70 miles away. How in the world are you gonna blame a parent, a, a birthing uh, person for not going to a medical appointment in a place where it's the poorest county in the state of South Carolina where the average person makes $32,500 a year. There's no public transportation. People are exceedingly racist in ways you would not believe, right? So how in the world are you gonna blame that patient? Because they don't wanna go and be disrespected by the one OBGYN who is in the county who only accepts patients who have insurance. Those are the kinds of factors that need to be put into play. And oftentimes they are not and patients are being blamed. So finally we are having a reckoning and I'm, I'm happy to be a part of that conversation nationally. Thank you so much for that question. Uh, great question. Um, we're almost out of time, but um, we have another question from a student. I guess this will be our last question um, from Jacob. Uh, first of all, thank you, Dr. Cooper Owens, for all of your work and time being here today. I know that a lot of arguments around this is that they, quote, blame the South or have this mentality today that is not, it's not happening in their city, especially in more liberal minded cities like Los Angeles, but how can we keep people engaged with this material, especially outside of the academia sphere? How can we make sure that people see this racism happening around them even today? You know, they see it. I always tell people, go look at uh, social media and look at the comments on Twitter, on Facebook, on, you know, on Instagram. I mean, people are constantly talking about race and racism, right? Um, they might not do so in polite spaces, you know, um, in, in the ways that they kind of let loose when there's anonymity and, and those kinds of things. But people are certainly talking about it. And what I would say is academics outside of a few, obviously the scholars who do, you know, the medicine and public health and those, like we've been talking about this for a while, people just weren't interested. It really was the folk on the ground, you know, a lot of the activists and the advocates. And I got to give a shout out to the public health folk they got it and they were they were beating the drums you know trying to get the message out even folk like david satcher we think about you know big government david satcher was 
you know, I think maybe the first black surgeon general, I can't remember if he was first or second, um, but in, in the 1990s under the Clinton administration, he was like, hey y'all, racism is a problem. We need to have a 10 year plan. Nobody listened. By the 21st century, COVID-19 became, became the great revealer around all things racist and racial and inequitable. And all of a sudden, you had the CDC say for the first time in this country's history, in April, 2021, you know, racism is a public health crisis. Finally, they started to listen. So I do think that there's an amplification happening. I would say follow the activists, the, the reproductive justice and birthing activists. They are the ones who know, follow the public health folk. And, you know, there are not a whole lot of folk who do what I do. So sometimes I can be really overwhelmed <laughs> with requests because you know they just are not a lot of folks, but that number is growing. Um, and also follow the birth workers, the doulas, the midwives. Um, those are people who are very active. So med, Twitter, those kinds of places. Um, you can even just Google things like decolonizing the medical syllabus and things will come up. Um, so there, there are all kinds of ways I think that you as a student, Jacob, can get people involved in having these conversations to book clubs, all of those things. Thank you. Yeah, good question. Um, I'm not, uh, there is one more question, but I'm not sure if we should keep going. Um, I, 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 to I'll answer it quickly. Um, Faley, I hope I'm saying your name right. You know what, go to, go to Earth, go to, um, uh, doula, just put in Black doula organizations, Black midwives, Mothers of Gynecology, even on my website, shameless plug, DeirdreCooperOwens.com, I have a list of resources of women-owned or Black-owned or um, gender-affirming uh, websites that talk about these very issues. Also, as patients, there is a national um, advocacy group where patients can get access to patient navigators or, act, uh, or advocates. So if you feel uncomfortable uh, or people in your, you know, just kind of in your circle feel uncomfortable when they are communicating with doctors because of that hierarchy and all of that stuff, go to those websites. You can just put in the keywords, they'll pop up and you can have that kind of access. And this is Black Maternal Health Week. So you, oh, guess what? Guess what? There is a, um, a panel that will be going on in, uh, on Saturday at the Wing West Hollywood. Allison Felix, the most decorated uh, Olympian, is going to be uh, commemorating Black Maternal Health Week. I, I will be one of those panelists. Um, Melanie Fiona, the singer. Um, Debbie Allen, not the, the Debbie Allen that we think of, but a woman, a Black woman who created a midwifery organization um, is going to be another panelist and Self Magazine is sponsoring it. And so they'll be talking about this because Allison Felix was kicked, kicked off um, her sponsorship by Nike when she became pregnant. And they, I mean, they kicked the woman off. She was like, oh, I'll show you, had her baby, came back, won more medals and became the most decorated Olympian in this country's history. And she, when Nike said, come back, she said, no, I'm going institution bill. And she did so with her brother and the black maternal health focus is a part of her, her issue. So there are things going on right in your area that you can attend and, and, and meet people and build more community. That's, those are some great resources. Thank you for that. And thank you, Faley, for your questions. Um, I guess this is the end of our time with um, Dr. Cooper Owens. Um, thank you so much. This has been really informative and um, we we're really lucky to have had um, your expertise and time. Thank you, Pitzer. Thank you to all of those who were attending to the administrators. Um, I had an illness in my, my family that prohibited me from leaving in the middle of the week. So I really thank you for transforming this very quickly into a, into a webinar and thank you for your engagement. I am really, really grateful for it.